So, but I'm going to turn over to Vicki Reed, but first I'd like to give her an introduction. Vicki Reed has spent her career working to improve the lives of children placed in the juvenile justice system. She began on the front lines as staff member at a juvenile detention facility before becoming a juvenile court probation officer. She was the director of a private youth serving agency that operated a group home for status and public offender youth, where she worked to get funding to open a shelter for boys who would otherwise have been placed in secure detention. She then began a career in Kentucky state government where she helped develop a training curriculum for the state's child welfare workers and community juvenile staff. When Kentucky formed its Department of Juvenile Justice to address deplorable condition for youth and adult jails, Vicki was instrumental in helping to transform the system and bring Kentucky into compliance with federal law. She helped set up regional detention centers and worked to develop alternative placements for appropriate youth. Kentucky is now one of only eight states in the nation that does not have any child below the age of 18 in an adult jail or prison. Something we can be excited about. <laughs> As DJJ's Director of Classification, she helped develop risk assessment tools and champion the use of therapeutic foster care. After leaving DJJ, Vicki worked for a private foster agency, NECO, which many of you may know or have children here placed with. Vicki is currently the Executive Director of Kentucky Juvenile Justice Initiative, an advocacy group whose goals included ending mandatory waiver to adult court, a goal that was met with 2021 legislation returning Kentucky to discretionary waiver, and banning the detention of status offenders. She also serves on the local Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. Vicki has a degree in law enforcement and a master's in criminal justice. It is no surprise to learn that Vicki, like Kelly Morgan and Carly, loves horses and nature <laughs> and cinnamon rolls. <laughs> wow, every time they do that, I think, wow, I sound really good. And I think it's just because I've gotten so old. You, know? <laughs> you get old, you've been on this stuff. And then, uh, you know, and I think people are either going to be really impressed by all I've done or think, wow, that woman couldn't keep a job. <laughs> you you want to sign in over there and get credit. She volunteers at the Kentucky Horse Park and is on the boards of both a city and private nature preserve. She's currently working on a follow-up novel, Sleight of Hand, which I've requested that Casa be in, as well as a nonfiction book about foster care with delinquent kids titled Paper Monsters. Join me in welcoming Lexington's own author, Vicki Reed. to be here. And by the way, just so you know, because of uh, the local thing, the, the thing is, uh, there, have everybody ever heard of Easter eggs with authors? You heard mm -hmm. that time? Oh, there's some people who are knowledgeable. An Easter egg is when you know something because the author is local or you know that author. And uh, the, the agency that I developed is now Harbor Youth Services, if you all are familiar. It was Metro Group Home when the Junior League wow. started it. And we had, we had on 4th Street, we had the it was a co-ed facility for uh, boy and girls uh, status offenders. And then I opened, to, to really date myself here, we opened what we called, I named it, the Metro Alternative Shelter House, uh, MASH. And it was because, you know, it was a popular TV series at the time. But I wish we'd open, Sonny told me that if they ever opened one, they were going to call it With Friends. And so when people say, well, where are you, where are you staying? Where do you live? And it goes, with friends. <laughs> <laughs> so share the Easter egg about uh, where Kelly stays, because there's that's another, that's there's coming. a fun fact that, in this room. That's, that's, that's coming. That will, okay. that will be, All right. that will be, that will be there. <laughs> so what I've done that, but before when I've done this is kind of give you a little spiel about how the book came to be. And then I like to open it up and answer any questions you have. And then I have, you know, a few other little things on here. And uh, I said before COVID, I thought Zoom was something kids did with little cars. They went Zoom, Zoom. And so, you know, now I like to do PowerPoints and everything. I'm so real impressed with myself. I can even click occasionally. I'm like, oh, I give this to uh, messing up. But I thought, to, I thought I'd start with a couple of questions for my audience here. This is a general thing. Uh, so... I, I want you to read them, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do all three, and then we'll come back in a minute. So there's there's the first one. You know, it's juvenile crime out the roof, saying it's always is. It's all about a generation we've ever had. All right, we're going to number two. Here. Is this as a nation or a state? Either. Gene, you on that? I got it. <laughs> all right. Here's another question. Now let's go back. I think I think I'll change my mind. So what do you think the answer would be on this one? C. No, probably B. B. I saw somebody go like this. I was thinking that was C. <laughs> <laughs> probably B. B. 
B. B. B. Well, actually, that's C. Okay. The first one was not. And this, this, this tends to surprise people. Uh, every, no matter any time through 50 years I've done this, everybody thinks juvenile crime's out of control. Oh, the kids are terrible. They're awful. It's out of control. And for a while in the 90s, people really thought that. The juvenile crime weight was really up. And, you know, there was this super predator thing and all that. But it is right now, it's the lowest it's ever been in recorded history. It is extremely low. Now we hear about the violence going on, and so and there is a blip lately with some serious stuff, but overall, even during the COVID, it, it, the actual rate is down. And there's a lot of discussion about why that might be. And there's different theories. And uh, one of them is that we took lead paint out of paint and gasoline. And uh, this is a pretty good theory because when they used to do blood levels of kids who lived in urban areas, their blood, their lead blood was way up. And if you have that in your bloodstream, it makes you more impulsive, more aggressive, more learning disabled. And so there's some thought that some of the violent crime that we saw, especially from inner cities, came from the fact that we had, you know, we were polluting people. And the, the other answer you might have right there with you, or the other possible one. Um, so, you know what I mean? Like, okay, again, dating myself, but when I was a teenager and you got six boys together on a Saturday night with nothing to do, trouble might have ensued. <laughs> you know, hey, let's get in the car, go down to TP the principal's house, or, you know, let's see. He's laughing, he knows. <laughs> we grew up together, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Well, nowadays, when you see five kids sitting together, what are they doing? They're not even talking. <laughs> They're texting each other right there. So there's some thought that, you know, the fact that kids are bored like they used to be. They're not running around. They'd rather, you know, do this you know, type of thing. There's also the theory that if they get locked up, they don't have their phones. And that would be truly torturous. And so we we, uh, we can't have that. So so the phones are one thing. And that's a, another interesting thing is the video games. There are actually some thought that, that maybe that's lowered crime, not because of the boredom but because they are showing that uh, games like Tetris actually rewire the brain from trauma. And various hospitals now, when somebody comes in from a car wreck or a shooting has been in some traumatic event, as soon as they're able, they will have them play Tetris. So there's some thought, you know, how we talk about kids self-medicate by getting into drugs and alcohol to cure their depression, that some of them are actually self-curing themselves from trauma by the, by the use of video games. So it's all fascinating, but nobody really knows. These, these are all just uh, just possible uh, theories. All right, here's the other one. What do you think about the juvenile justice system? Just like easy peasy, kids having a great old time. Uh, what we really need is a good old boot camp. <laughs> it's awful run by a bunch of corrupt guards who beat and abuse the kids. Yeah, you know where I'm going C. on this one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's C. Uh, but it would be amazing how often that you get into this. You know, I hear this all the time. Well, what the kids really need is a good boot camp. They just need they need discipline and that would fix. It. We now know that that is like the worst thing you could possibly do. Boot camps, when they studied them, had an 80 percent recidivism rate. <laughs> Basically, kids came in and left worse than when they came in. Uh, and one of this, so this is a, a fascinating thing I've learned recently. Does anybody know anything about the limbic system? You know what the limbic system is? It's your survival system, okay? And we all have one. And so it's always scanning the environment, watching out for you. So when you're in a bathtub or in a swimming pool for a long time, what, ha what happens to your fingers and toes? They get, they get all wrinkly. And I always thought it was just moisture, right? But then it was like, if that's just moisture, then why in your legs and your stomach and your arm? Why is it just your fingers and toes? Well, the answer is it's your limbic system. And it it got set back in caveman days and there were not pools and hot tubs and nice things like that. And so what your limbic system thinks is you're in trouble. You have fallen in water and you cannot get out. I am going to help you. It drains the blood from your fingers and toes, making them stickier and slicker, enabling you to help scramble up a bank to get out. Isn't that fascinating? First time I heard that, I thought, that's a lie. But I Googled it, and it's true. It must, tell me it. <laughs> it must be true. <laughs> but, but that's the thing that we get into. And the kids that you all get involved with, too, that's the system. And what we say with, the, with a lot of the kids that end up in juvenile justice, it's like, it's like a hum in the background. It's been going on. And for kids that are, have been very food deprived for a long time, it takes a, a, quite a while for the limbic system to figure out you're okay. And that's why when you have two kids in line and you give the first one two extra tater tots, they start a fight might ensue because that kid got two more tater tots than I got. 
uh, because my limbic system's telling me food is a big issue for you. Uh, and that's why yoga is showing such wonderful results. And we're doing that in a lot of juvenile justice settings. Now. We're, giving, we're doing yoga because it tells the body that you're okay. Uh, another thing some of the therapists are doing, you know, the old raccoon eyes. I have a hard time doing that anymore. But yeah, they'll actually have kids do that before they do groups and so forth because it tells the body when you raise your arms up, you're okay. Because when you're, when you're tense and tight, you draw your arms in. And that's another thing with kids in the juvenile justice, sometimes they get like they'll clench their fist and their things and they get disciplined for it. Don't you be looking like that. You stop that right now. And for a lot of them, they can no more control that than they can make their fingers not shrivel. It's just it's their limbic system uh, coming to coming to save them. So that's just just a few little things. All right. Final question. General public person. You all aren't the most general public person because you all are kind of <laughs> in the biz, but you go where I am. Uh, and you know where I'm going with this one, too, because I always say and I used to work for the cabinet for families and children before I uh, came over to DJJ and did a lot of work with child welfare stuff, too. You know, I always say, do you ever see a movie where social workers are portrayed good? They're always either evil, awful persons, you know, smoking a cigarette while some kids get beat. Oh, I can't think of her. Or there's some, you know, there's a wonderful family and they're running in there going, I'm going to yank your kid from you. They're, oh, you know, and they're mean and the music drums up. The only show I can ever think of that gave a fairly decent portrayal was Judging Amy. Yep, mm -hmm. Judging Amy. But you just don't see that, you know. So a lot of the public, you know, gets sort of a, a bad on idea on that. So all of this is my little sneaky way of leading up to why I wrote this book. <laughs> and it was really more written. It's, it's being really popular among people in the biz. And like I said, classes have been a great big purchaser and detention centers and several juvenile justice and other places and some, you know, general public too, but I actually wrote it for the general public because I realized people just, you know, they don't know. They don't know. It's all confidential. It takes place behind closed doors and they don't know who our kids are and they don't know what happens with them. All they know is movies of the week. And again, same thing with juvenile justice. You know, the kids are always, you know, and I, I can't hardly stand to watch juvenile justice program. They're all so wrong. And one of my favorite is, and those of us in the biz know this well is, the kid goes to detention and he's visiting day along come a few of his gang buddy friends. And they say, if you tell on us, if you snitch, we're going to beat the crap out of you and blah, blah, blah. And the kid's terrified. And, you know, they leave. Well, gangbanger kids don't go visit kids in yeah. detention. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't happen. Parents and attorneys are about the only people that ever once in a while a grandparent or a sibling on a special day. They don't just, it's not like the jail where you just march in and visit anybody. So I always like, it's like, it's, I'm a horse person too. Anybody else in here a horse person? No. All right. Well, something you're a specialty in. The other thing that drives me crazy if you're a horse person is you watch what they're doing. You're like, that's, you wouldn't put those kind of shipping boots on to put that horse in that trailer. <laughs> <laughs> so you're always lo looking for the uh, errors. My husband says he doesn't like to watch TV or movies with me. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Toni Morrison, that might be somebody's name you might know. And I, I love this quote from her. She said, if there's a book you want to read and you can't find it, write it yourself. And I had gone looking. I Googled and thought, you know, looked for books. And they were all the ones I got. Like I said, they were all just, you know, for the most part, uh, terrible and awful. And also Stephen King. Uh, anybody in here Stephen King fans? Yeah. Okay, I am not. <laughs> as far as his horror stuff, I find real life horrifying enough. So, <laughs> uh, so, but I, he has a classic book. I don't know if you know that. It's this book on writing. It is, and I am a fan of that book. That is one of the best books, you know, because that's what I people say. Oh well, I guess you always wanted to be a writer. No, I guess you always had A in English. No, <laughs> uh, none of that. But I did go research and when I decided to write a book and I went to the, you know, the library and uh, various and sundry places. And the best place I found was a Restore, the one on South and Drive, you know how they have books. Mm -hmm. There was this whole section. I mean, that's been 12 books about writing and all of that. And I thought, oh, somebody died. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's no reason 12 books would have been in there. Maybe they just downsized. We're like to be optimistic. <laughs> but uh, but it, one of his lines was, you know, you know, a book plumber in outer space would likely be a bestseller. And it's true. We, we generally tend to like to, to read about what we do. So so uh, that that kind of gave me the idea. So I did want a book that would be both educational and and a good story to read. Uh, and then, like I said, the purpose was to educate folks and through some empathy. Uh, I made Kelly pretty empathetic. How many of you all have actually read the book? Is everyone? Oh my gosh! Is it? Oh, everybody! Wow, this is great. I have to tell you, anybody else in our book club. Oh, it's okay. 
I only read part of it. I thought <laughs> 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 it just don't have to the bus. I have to get the garbage and done up afterwards. <laughs> There's no work here. I can do the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I have done this. Anybody else in regular old book clubs and some other ones? I've been. I've done several book clubs, and and, and one of them they, they forewarned me that half the people never read the book. Whatever, ever, not just mine. Every time they they were grumbling that their people. But you all have been well disciplined. They got them too. My <laughs> sister also read it when she was visiting me one weekend. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> good. I'll read it. <laughs> well, that's mine. Like nice. it. Nice. She was going to recommend it to her school teacher friends. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let them know. I some volunteers and folks from around the state, don't we, that are on virtual or at yes. least that um, signed up. So you got some, some folks listening. Oh, well, I was going to say, I love to do book clubs and I, I, my, I'll put my website and stuff up here. And I do a lot of Zooming book clubs. I, I was telling somebody before we started that I, my best one so far has been one for Venice, Florida. Because one of the people held their tablet up and let me watch the sunset over the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so now I've done Las Vegas. I've done several. But that's the glory now with, with Zoom is I can pop in anywhere. So I love to do book clubs. So if anybody uh, wants to, to inspire in the form. And I also wanted greater community involvement for people. And, and that kind of worked. Because one of the things I was doing was just getting supplies and stuff for the juvenile detention center. And uh, and I would put on Facebook, oh, I'm, I need a exercise bike for a youth serving organization. <laughs> I didn't say what it was for. Because <laughs> people think, oh, youth serving or probably a church group or something. I was afraid if I put for juvenile detention. But actually, I have found out that people really do want to help. And, and like one of the churches uh, here in town uh, donates all the stuff for us to do little Christmas bag goodies uh, for the kids. They, they don't get much. They, they don't get anything. So we get those little we get those little gift bags and just fill them with like little Debbie cakes and candy canes, <clears throat> Doritos and one soft drink. And, and that's a, that's their Christmas. And uh, they're very excited about the little bag of goodies that they get. And one of the church donated all the food items, you know, bought them all so we could, could fill that in there. So uh, anyway, so that that was sort of the purpose of the book. Oh, look, I've got the little hands on there. I'm not sure how that. Um, <laughs> that was so, <laughs> interesting. I didn't see that before. You mentioned for who are the kids. I talk about crossover kids. Y'all know what crossover kids are? You probably see them. Those are those are dual, what we call dual status kids. They're kids who are involved with both child welfare and juvenile justice. And we see a lot of that. We see a ton of, of and some of our most difficult kids are not uh, the really serious violent offenders. They're kids who had 64 prior placements. And, and we have a girl right now uh, that had 64 uh, prior placements. Um, Anyway, so and, and and the other thing they the statistic they put out if a kid has had five or more placements, they're ninety percent likely to touch the juvenile justice system. So that's that's a big issue. And with dual status with crossover, they can do it two or three different ways. The most common way is you have a kid, you know, like the girl that I know of right now. They had all the places. she came into foster care at seven. So that's a very common. They're in child welfare. And then while they're in a foster home or at the Methodist home or, you know, some other congregation, they pick up a charge and then they end up to juvenile. But we do have some that come the other way. They come into us. And when they're strip searched before they go into detention, they're covered with bruises. And so we, we make a, you know, we find out that the stepfather, you know, whopped on them good before they came to us. So we make a, a child abuse referral on them. So it can go It's more common the first way, but uh, it, can, it can go the other way, too. Uh, some of the other things just we do to kids, I'll talk about some of those things. And like she mentioned, I'm so pleased it took 20 years, but we have repealed it just this last session, the mandatory transfer. And that's what Kelly, that's, that was the situation with Kelly, was that you have to be, there's no, there's no discretion. If you do this offense and meet these parameters, it does not matter your background, anything, you must be tried as an adult. And so I was looking, I was going to, I had an idea what I was going to do with the story to, to make that transition. And then along came a state, and I've, I can't remember which state it is. I want to say Michigan, I could be wrong, um, that talked about the fact that it was a mandatory thing. If you escape from a secure juvenile facility to commit a felony, you must be tried as an adult. So I was like, bingo, there's my kid. <laughs> and I did mention in the book, we really did have it. This really did happen when I was with the, when I was with Department of Juvenile Justice before we built a juvenile detention center in, in London, and it was basically a sweetheart deal that somebody 
did money for whoever owned it or something or another. And it was built uh, where they didn't do those perk tests. You know how guys know this, you know, they're the perk test, whatever. Anyway, it was apparently built on an old swamp or something and it started immediately sinking. And so the doors very soon wouldn't lock because they would like, you know, but they were. <laughs> I mean, I think now it's like you st- it's still there. I think the Kentucky State Police have it now, but it's like ticked down too. But uh, there was a place where the fence had pulled away from the wall and the kids shimmied up there and popped through. So that was uh, that was my, my other thing I stole. But basically, almost everything in the book I stole from somewhere. It was like something out of my little repertoire I read about or uh, or something. So, so I did. And some people did mention that, um, you know, I didn't want anybody to get uh, too depressed reading the book. So I did try to I did try to balance out some humor because I've really had several people say that when I did book clubs would say that, well, you know, Sarah said she wanted us to do this book. And I, I thought I really don't want to read that. And, uh, you know, she was kind of like, you know, but they, they kind of got into it. So I, I hope did, did I do an OK job with the educating and entertaining <laughs> Uh, did I get too preachy? <laughs> no. no. Well, my writing mentor smacked me several times for that. Uh, and everybody knows the Carnegie Center here in town. I had a wonderful writing mentor. I mentioned her in the front of the book, Mary Knight. And she is a, a the environmental 2017 Green Award winner for her book. She has a YA book called uh, Saving Wonder. If you've ever seen it, she's a local author. Well, anyway, she does mentoring. So I ended up uh, hooking up with her. Uh, from the Carnegie Center. So, and it was kind of funny because, the, uh, you know, I'd contact her whenever she goes, well, I'll tell you what, uh, send me your first 50 pages and and we'll see what we got. And so I sent her 50 pages. She said, probably take a couple of weeks. I'm kind of busy. So I kept thinking, well, I'll probably get 11 or 12 days. So it's like 14. I'm like, well, she's going to call me up and say, don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally I get an email from her and I'm like, mm, you know, click. And she goes, well, I, I read the pages and I know what you want to know, you know, do, do you have anything? She goes, and I think you do, and I would like to work with you. So she was the one, but several times I got too preachy, and she would, she had read one of those red pens like teachers have. And like, we do. <laughs> yeah. So what does that mean that you got too preachy that she didn't want in there? Like what? Oh, I, I, too much lecturing about juvenile stuff. You know, it's like, it was like, you know, like I tried to build it into conversations. Like I have Sam. Right. And uh, Henry talking, they're going, well, nobody cares about, you know, so and I have like um, uh, Henry and his boss talking. But one time on that, I had Henry doing too much musing. It was just too much. It was too much. And so and then that was actually how it came out that I that I had I introduced Henry's boss's character so that he would have some a foil to discuss that stuff with. So I tried to, it's kind of like when you uh, make spaghetti and you try to sneak vegetables in for, to feed your kids. <laughs> so so I, I tried to sneak it in there without getting, without getting too preachy. But this was one, this was one of my favorite ones. I'm, I'm you know, as a writer, you know, you're also your first reader. So I really, I liked my one. This is, this is so typical of a kid, you know, going not another word. Fine. <laughs> Which of course is, a, is another word. Uh, and this, this was another just juvenile thing on the earth. Did, did you all like Mandy, the girl mm-hmm. in the shelter? Yeah. yeah. And Mary, when I started to work with her, I gave her 50 <clears throat> pages at a time. So she didn't know what was going to happen at the end either. And so I'd given her the 50 and it, it, it calmed through Kelly's time at the shelter. And then I, I said, oh, well, you know, she said, well, next time something with Mandy. I said, oh, she'll be written out. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 no. I like Mandy. You need to leave Mandy in there. And I said, this is a reality of these kids. They don't get to make long-term relationships. That might be your thought. Have Look, we need to see Mandy again. I was hoping she reappeared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, and that and, and that was a factual thing that you don't, that these kids, you know, that stay in congregate care. And that's one reason I'm not, especially with child welfare kids, I, I think kids should be in foster care and families as much as possible. I only, you know, I don't think kids should ever be in congregate care for lack of a better placement or we couldn't find another spot. I think because they give up so much, they don't get those long-term relay. You know, I grew up with kids down the street that knew me from the time we went to first grade and just waited for the school bus. And these kids don't have that. They don't have those long-term relationships. So uh, that's one of the things that they lose. And this is another thing I, I stole from my thing because we had that too at our shelter. And most shelters still have that. You have a 30 day limit. And this still goes on today. I don't know if you all ever seen any cases with this, but they'll move kids around. And we even had a thing where they would like, um, they finish their 30 days at station A, go to station B for 30 days, and then they could go back to station A for 30 more days because they've been gone 30 days. 
And that's how kids get 64 placements is that kind of thing that goes on. I'd like to think, of, and we are better about it in the family first. I think there's going to be a lot more impact and less about that. But, you know, I ran a shelter and that was a, that was a reality of it too. And I saw you all know about ACEs. So I, I threw some of that in there too. Um, so let me ask you, anybody here want to write a book? Okay, there you go. Well, you know, when they when they ask people who wants to write a book, 80% say they want to. Guess what percent do? Five. Five. <laughs> 1%. 1%. 1%. And then I read, and this was really important to me when I started writing, you know what the number one difference between a successful author and one that's not? The successful one finishes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and seriously, I took some writing classes at Carnegie and people have been working on a book for 30 years <laughs> and they like rewritten it and tossed it or threw one aside and started another. But there is this whole, and there's nothing wrong if they enjoy it. It's like a hobby, but there are a lot of people who, who will work on a, a book and just, you know, never, never get it done. Anybody ever watch Longmire? Oh, yeah. The series that was on there, if you followed, it's a great, that, his books are wonderful. I think The Cold Dish is the first one, and there, there's like a whole series, of them, and uh, I really love those, but I watched him at a, a writer's thing, and, and of course, he you know, that's a TV show and very popular, but he wrote part of the thing, and he wanted, it's about a sheriff, and ironically, out west, and he, he gave it to one of the local law enforcement people to read. And uh, then he said he got busy building a chicken coop and, and then a barn and then a house. And uh, 10 years went by and he had not picked the book back up. So one day he's pumping gas and this guy pulls up next to him in the sheriff's car. It's a guy and he goes, oh, yeah, I remember you. He goes, about that book. Coming kind of slow, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, so, and, and people always ask me how long mine took, and it took about a year to write 90% of it. And then after I got involved with Mary, while she was doing the first 50 pages, I was finishing up the last. And then it took another year of editing because uh, we, like I said, we would do 50 pages at a time, and I had to do a lot of major rewrites and uh, work at it. So it, it took me like two years is about about what it what it came to. And we actually have a comment from, I mean, okay. uh, Ashley is going to unmute and, okay. oh, she raised her hand, but now she's, she doesn't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see, can I get to the next one here? I think this is my, this is actually my stopping point, I think here. But I have to wait for him to move, he said. <laughs> there you go. Ah, there we go. Ah, so th this, was, this was a part I was not, so... So the book came out, and uh, several of you had the first edition, which is actually the one that is still on Amazon. Uh, and so three weeks after I did the first edition, I, I, by that time I'm trying now, I have moved from writing to marketing. <laughs> and I had self-published, um, because I don't know if anybody knows how much trouble it is to try to get a traditional publisher. Uh, Mary told me, I, think you, I really think you should look for a traditional publisher. And I said, well, explain what happens. She said, well, you need to write all these query letters and you need to mail this all that out and then they'll get whatever. And he said, the average time between you sending it out, if you were really successful, is two years. Oh, and I looked at Mary and I said, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have two years to wait. I, I want to at least say you know, on my grave, I wrote a book. I, I can't wait that much longer. So I decided to self-publish. And uh, so then I just, you know, read how to, then I'm Googling again, how to sell a book, <laughs> put it on Amazon. And then I, you know, did some other stuff. And so I sent it to anybody and everybody. And, and one of the things they said was start working on your next book. That's how you sell your first book. So I started working on the next one and I wanted to do this little thing. And it's called the millimeter acknowledgement. When you're working with kids this is what this is what this is. This is when you have a kid and you say, well, I, I guess you're pretty upset because your parents are divorcing and they go, hell no, I don't care. Somebody me, and they're acting bad and all this kind of stuff. And so if you keep saying, well, you know, most people would be upset. Are you sure you're not? I'm not upset. I don't care. So the millimeter acknowledgement, what this is, is when you say, do you think that it's maybe just slightly possible, maybe a half of 1% that maybe because your parents are divorced and maybe it upsets you just a little bit? Well, yeah, maybe a little bit. And so that's called the millimeter acknowledgement. So I, I knew that from this guy's book. Uh, Charlie Appelstein, who wrote, he sold over a million of these books. No such thing as a bad kid. 
So I, I had met him 30 years ago at a conference. One time, sat at the table next to him, you know, back when we could have conferences with the round tables with the chicken dinners. <laughs> and uh, he sat next to me and I was like, I don't know if you remember me, blah, blah, blah. But I wrote this book and I'm working on another one. And I want to use that. And it's in your book. And I, I didn't, mind, you know, would, would it be okay if I used it? He's like, oh, hey, we're all in this together. You know, use it the way he goes. Well, what's your book? I want to buy it. So I'm like, I tell him. So he tells me the story later. He's like, he's here all the time. Yeah, I wrote a book. Yeah. <laughs> so about two weeks go by and I'm in the middle of typing something or it's on the computer. You know, your little thing comes up in the corner with your email and it's Charlie Appelstein. And it's all in caps with exclamations. I am loving this book. So he contacted me and started asking me all these questions like, you know, about my percentages and my this and that. And I was like, huh? Uh, So he offered to publish my book for me. So he is Soaring Wings Press out of Appelstein uh, Training Resources. So he, he he is a small publisher. I'm not like the big five, like Penguin or Random House or anything. But and so he... He said, well, I have my book people. He's in New Hampshire and his book people are in New Mexico. So he wants his book people to take a look at it. And they 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 said, well, the cover's too dark and they didn't like the font. They wanted a dyslexic friendly font. Did you all know there's such a thing? Yes. yes. It, I did not know this either. Know the, the difference is, it's like if you write a, let's see. Here's your B and your D. In a dyslexic friendly font, you can't even hardly notice it, but the B and Ds are a little darker. And so if you're dyslexic, that tells you that's a B and that's a, oh, <laughs> it tells you that's a B and that's a D. So they changed, they changed the font. They added those cute little graphics and did a few, and we did just a few. We found a couple of typos and there was one really bad word in there I took out. And <laughs> so anyway, so the new one came out. The problem I'm having is I've had a terrible time trying to upload <laughs> the newer book to Amazon. It's on Kindle, <laughs> the newer one, but I've, I've hired somebody to do that. We're meeting on the 21st to finally get, uh, once you have it on Amazon, it's, it's difficult to get it up on there. So uh, that's why, but, but these are books that Charlie ordered. He did a run of 3,500 for the first so he sent me 500 and he kept the other 3,000. 3, so, and it was really nice because uh, the first time when the book came out, Rosemary uh, from the Ohio Valley Casa bought 175 and uh, had, had me as a speaker at their thing. And then the, the, uh, one of the ad districts bought 50. So it's nice. I never even thought about doing bulk, bulk buys. So that was nice. But anyway, so this is a point I want to turn it over to you all and, and answer any questions that you might have about the book. And I'll, I'll give you a couple. Oh, let me I'll, let me mention one other thing before we go on. Uh, again, I'm just kind of really shocked at the reception of the book. I got the number one. The Campaign for Youth Justice puts out their top ten summer reading list every year, and I got the top spot. So that was a that was a big deal. And then the Coalition for Juvenile Justice, DC, did a, a started a book club during COVID last March, and I was their initial author uh, for that. And then I, the Global Center on Women and Justice, which is out of uh, Vanguard University in California, uh, contacted me to do a podcast for them. I got in the New York Review of Books. I got, told you I got picked up. And I have to tell you, this one just happened last week. I got this in the email just last week. <laughs> I, I won in the reader's favorite gold medal winner in the fiction legal thriller category. <laughs> so I'm going to be getting thanks. I, I, so they send me that big roll. You know, have you ever been to bookstore, those little gold medallions? So basically, you know, you think they look real impressive, but you peel and stick them, apparently. <laughs> so they're sending me a roll of those. I get a little medal. So, you know, it's all kind of nice. So there, that, that's who I beat out there. So uh, anyway, I thought it was ironic that the fourth one there was Wyoming. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm showing it to my husband. And, and, of course, I would have been thrilled to have been even a finalist. I had no clue. Uh, but being the kind of corrupt person that I am, so I, I, oh, she's not here. She knows my husband. So I'm showing it to him. He's sick of hearing about the book. I mean, it's one of the little jokes. Oh, yeah, your book, your book. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm showing this. I show it. I go, I point to the, all the others. And I go, losers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so uh, we'll, we'll start a little discussion here. I'll, I'll, I'll start you off with something, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So who is your favorite character? Kelly, everybody's Kelly. 
How about second? They might veer off on that one. Sam. Sam. <laughs> I have to tell you, when I was doing this, when I was doing, yeah, when I was doing this, uh, when Sam got introduced with the 50 pages for Mary, uh, Mary came in that day uh, and was meeting with me. She goes, I want to ask you about this Sam guy. She goes, is, is he based on somebody you know? I said, well, no, really. He's just composite, you know, just made much. She goes, well, that's a real shame because I want to marry him. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I think Sam does appeal to the female uh, folks in the audience. He's just like the perfect guy, right? He's a guy's guy. He's, he's a woman guy. Uh, kind of. How about any other characters? Bonnie for me. You like Bonnie? I like Bonnie. Yeah, I like Bonnie too. Well, I like all my characters, except the mean, awful woman. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, she was nobody's favorite character. Who's that? I knew her though. The, the mean woman. Miss <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Isaacs. <laughs> Oh, yeah. we, had, we had to have at least one mean, nasty person in the book. Well, uh, I like the horse woman too. She was yeah, 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 yeah. I liked, yeah. I like her, and she is based she on people I know realistic. because I, I've written all my life, and uh, she she's that kind of person that you take riding lessons from. That when you fall off, goes well, that's your fault. Don't <laughs> you, know, yeah. you have your horse's mouth. <laughs> like his lawyer Henry, because he went out of the way to wear those crazy yeah ties just yeah. for him and right. Yeah. Yeah. He was just as everybody else in the beginning. Getting like, I don't want this case. Right. Right. Somebody else. Right. Did I end up doing here? And then he really was very involved. With right. And that, that was another thing when I was working with Mary. She told me I was breaking all the rules. She said, I don't know what to do about you. You keep breaking all the rules. Because again, when the first I said, well, we're going to have a change of, of view of the character, you know, the point of view is Kelly for the first. And she goes, no, it's too late. You can't do that. You can't, you can't get 100 pages in and bring in another character. So you need to put it in chapter two or three. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? Henry's mowing his yard. and not met the kid yet. I mean, I was, I was trying to think of how I, how I would do that. So I thought, well, I'm just going to have to leave it for now and see how it goes. So she came in the room and again, 50, I'm going to write a book called The First 50 Pages or something like that, 50 Days went. And she said, never mind what I said, it works. And she said, and the nice thing is, by the time Henry came in, I was ready for a break from Kelly. <laughs> I was ready for uh, somebody to come in to, to be Thank savior. You. All right, let's, let's try another one here. How about the beginning? <clears throat> Did it grab you right away? Yes. yes. Me. I can put it down. Yes. And that was that was by design, too. Um, and that's another thing when I was reading one of the one of the big beginner book things is to put all your backstory you know, here's my character. He has a car wreck. His things, you know, you write it all the thing. And then I'm, oh, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to dribble, dribble it all in and, and, you know, and start off with some exciting thing. So I thought, well, I'll have him start with the runaway. So that, that made sense to do. Mm -hmm. I like that you didn't put the whole thing about the granddad in that. I mean, he just got away. You knew he'd been hurt somehow, but you didn't really have right. the whole story until a little later on down the road. And really, for the first page, until you got to the end, you didn't even know it was a kid. Could have been a woman who was locked in there, you know, Kelly, which could be either whatever, and I'm locked in. And so, you know, until you got to the end of the page, that's when you find out, you know, he goes, and I'm only 12 years old, that, that you're even uh, talking about how, a kid. How did, you, how did you come up with what happened to him, like? You know, when kids go AWOL, it's sort of like a black hole. You know, we, I think we don't really have a really good understanding of what that's like and really bad things can happen and sometimes they do okay. So how did you come up with that? I thought it was like, I don't know. At first, I actually wasn't drawn in because when that when he went and was working with the horses, I thought, this doesn't seem realistic to me. But, you know, then as I got more into it, I thought, well, it's not always terrible things right. that happen. So how did you come up with that part? Well, some of that was just pure imagination. And some of it would be, honestly, was like, well, if I was a kid on the run, how would I survive? And, uh, and I would think, you know, I always thought of that when I would sit at a hotel and stuff. Let's keep anybody from just coming off the street and sitting there and grabbing food off of it. They don't, you know, people just walk, especially if you're a kid. And then some of it did came from my time at the shelter of knowing uh, what what some kids were doing. And I did make Kelly smarter probably than your average kid. And mm -hmm. that part maybe not might be a little of, of the unrealistic, but he had to be smart to to be I a good person kind of to tell it. You could, if he was though. not smart, he couldn't have told you what was going on as much. So that was kind of a yeah, necessary. That was, that was the part. Like, well, oh, this kid's really resourceful. Yeah, as we learned more about his background, his dad being a sheriff and all, it, it helped that <laughs> I think are more believable. That his dad had yeah. sort of trained him. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I thought it was very realistic. Survival, but just to life, you know. That you had him go to the stables, especially as we all know, around this area. 
there are plenty of illegals that wouldn't tell on anybody because they don't want any attention. And they're doing what they have to do to survive and they have nothing against a 12 year old who's doing what he has to do to survive. And they, they would never rat anybody out. Well, I did, ha- I did have, have you heard of beta readers? You've heard of like beta gamers, like you say. Like, well, this is, they have you have beta readers. That's what you yeah, do now. Dance copy. Yeah, you, you. Well, that's yeah. Oh, she, she knows a really good name. Yeah, dance copy readers. And so one of my beta readers was a horse person, much more horsey than me. I mean, real horse person. You know, knows track and all that. And she and, and I, I asked her. I said, well, "How realistic is this?" With she said. There is nothing that's not realistic about the backtrack. I mean, she was telling me about parades they have. Of certain, you know what I'm talking about? And so <laughs> she said that anything and everything goes on on the backside of tracks. And so that it would be truly believable. The one thing she did change was I had to, had Kelly say that he was tying up a 1600 pound horse and that he's good with knots. She's like, no, no, that's a draft horse. Make it 1200. <laughs> okay, so I, I made it 1200. So she, I, so I had like different types of beta readers, and she was my, you know, to make sure I didn't say something wrong with the horse stuff. Because even though I've ridden, I'm not at the, you know, I'm more the pleasure horse type. She's done show and racing and that kind of thing. So I, I had to ask for that too. And I can keep doing questions, but I want to answer you all. So well, I do have a question. Um, so at the beginning, you said that uh, one of your purposes in writing the book was um, to educate and maybe uh, garner more uh, engagement in uh, this with the children, with right? This and so forth. Is there any part of your purpose um, about change? Trying to change anything? Because as I read through it. I kept gravitate, not gravitate, I guess um, the things that were popping out at me were how could that possibly be happening? And does that really happen? And oh my gosh, that should never happen. Yes. <laughs> you know, I kept, those were the, I felt angst the whole time. I, <laughs> I did, I'll have to tell you, I, I really enjoyed it, but I was just, I was, oh. um, so is, is there any, purpose behind all of this to try to make changes in any well yeah absolutely and, and like part of it would be educating you folks I mean you read the book and now you all are in a position to you know be part advocates for change. and on the mandatory transfer that was one of my things too that people would see oh well it's stupid to have these rules we tie kids to and then they they go but then you know just the fact of looking at uh, you know and for child welfare agencies one of my thought would be I've always thought that after a certain level of, of placements, there ought to be some red flag that goes up. And after the kid has had this, we go to some extraordinary things to do something that is, you know, danger, danger, red alert stats. This kid has had X, Y, Z placements. We have got to do something about that, whether it's wrap around or extra money we put into it or, you know, whatever we do. So, you know, I'd like to think that some of those things could come out of it. I do have to ask one thing that you brought up, though, about your angst reading it. And I love asking this question because there's always one. So come on, add up. Who read, who cheated and read the end? Oh, I read the back. There you go. Thank you. You would never read the back of a book because I hate to know anything that's going to happen. But whatever it said that you, somewhere you said that you can control the outcome. I was like, okay, I can read this because we all have this garbage every day. I have three kids right now, three, three kids in a case. I, I can just, you know, call up their school teacher and get some garbage. Yeah, yeah. better turn out right. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun when I do this on Zoom because every time on Zoom, at least, you know, I'm doing the Brady Bunch thing. And then every time there'd be somebody goes, yeah, I read the back. And all the other little Brady Bunch people go. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> They're always like horrified, like that's cheating or whatever. But I always check the back of a book. I never read a book without checking the back. I don't want to I don't want to invest my interest in it until I know. I read, did anybody read A Thousand White Women? Somebody read that book. Well, I won't spoil it for you, though, but let me just tell you, I wish I'd read the back. That's the book that <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so now I like flip to the back. Okay, it sounds all right. So every time I do this, usually you, you all for a pretty good group of people to only have one. I thought I might have two or three, but there's always at least one person who, who said I, I read the back because then I could relax and enjoy it more without having to worry about it. And then some people told me, and that maybe that was the next question with the of the end. Some people told me that one of the reasons one of them read to the back was she was worried that it would end with him being 
taken to be executed for death penalty for committing for coming a school shooter or something. I was like, I never even considered that. But other people just worried he'd die or something. But she was she was worried he would like end up in prison for forever. So I hadn't even thought of that scenario. And I think she was, at one point I did flip to the last page and was like, he just better not die. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was actually what happened with my uh, with my horse person. And, and she and I, she actually, my, I board my horse at her farm and we've been riding together for a jigging years, but we don't do anything else. And the only time she ever sends me a text is the vet's coming tomorrow, leave, you know, send $20 or the blacksmith's coming or something. So I, uh, she had the book and I got a text and it was going on midnight. It was 1145. My first thought is my horse is lame or dead or something or another. <laughs> and she was reading, she had just started the book and it line said, so if you kill this kid, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> 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 so by the time it was 11.45 and she'd done it early, I was too late to text back. So the next day I think she was, oh, it's okay. I went ahead and read the back and check. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. But, but it was it, it was funny that that had happened. Yeah. I, I thought uh, pretty close to it, not too long. I guess after he went to Sam's, I kind of got the idea that he was going to end up with Sam. So mm -hmm. to me, the end was a little bit, um, not manufactured, but it seemed like it was an easy fix to make it a fairy tale. Or a you know a, yeah. a feel good story right and while I really really wanted that <laughs> I didn't feel like it was maybe as realistic as Mike and you're but, probably right you know it's what Mike would have happened I, I had a question though about the couple that had him for a little while my husband and I are at that place in life there's no freaking way we'd let that kid go back in the system I don't care if we were retired I, mean, I, <laughs> I just thought it was really odd that they didn't. Fight well, they him. were moving. Either, yes, yeah, they was. To me, that made sense. They <laughs> might be moving out of state, or where they couldn't just take a foster kid with them. Yeah, but I thought, I, you know, I think why, why didn't they advocate for them to have another foster? So just remember, or Eva, something. as a constant, you cannot take the children in. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told me that. I have to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a volunteer gig. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I have to tell you, though, that's very realistic. That that does happen. I mean, I, I knew of somebody who were foster parents for a girl for years and they got a job to move to California and they moved and left her behind. Mm. And, uh, you know, I mean, that ha it happens in the system that you, it it's not unusual. Life. And especially if you're just a temporary foster parent. I guess it, you would gear yourself to that. Thought yeah, process. it's kind of like people who take in temporary pets, you know, who yeah. do dogs and stuff. They, mm -hmm. they, they they do it and then let somebody else actually adopt. So there are people who, and they wouldn't know the long-term outcome. I mean, they just, and, and if they become a long-term foster home, then you don't have one for the short-term right. uh, type of thing. But the other thing I kind of built in was that he, they did get their uh, arms twisted a little bit at the end to take in this kid, that he was not their normal mm -hmm. uh, type that they took. <laughs> Uh, to, to take him in. And, and again, I've, you know, I, I did, since I was with a foster care agency, you know, I was able to build on some of that. And yeah, the ending is probably, you know, statistically not as likely as some other endings would be, but there are good endings out there. I know of some of them and I know of some, some, you know, that that's happened. I have to share one I do with a, a juvenile justice. Anybody heard of uh, Charles? Um, oh, no, his name. Oh, he's a black gentleman that uh, is an Oscar winner and an actor. Oh, Dutton, Charles Dutton, the Golden Globe Award winner. Anybody know him? He, uh, at 16, he was involved in a knife fight and stabbed a guy to death. And he went to the adult prison at 16 and served uh, several years there. Uh, got out, paroled, and got in an rob armed robbery, went back to prison. Uh, while he was there, he slugged a guard and got nine more years added to his sentence. Mm -hmm. And he always said, I got five years for killing a black man and nine years for punching a white guy. Uh, so he was a big disciplinary problem in the prison. And so he was going into solitary for like two weeks and they let him take one book. And by mistake, he grabbed the wrong one. He grabbed an, an anthology of black playwrights. And that was the one book he had for two weeks while he was in isolation. And he loved it. He just <laughs> read it over and over again. So when he got out, he asked the warden uh, if he could start a drama club in the prison. And the warden, who must have been a pretty good warden, said, well, you can if you go back and get your GED, you know, which they offered in the prison. So he did. And then eventually he got, you know, paroled again. And this time he went on to college and went to, I think it was Columbia University. And then the rest is history. He's like, you know, won all these Golden Globes. So, you know, there are, he, statistically, you wouldn't have thought that was his end. So, but, uh, but there are, you know, good stories. 
And like I said, I, I really wanted a good ending. So <laughs> I, picked I, one out. I wanted one out. I kind of cheated a little on that. There have been some comments in okay. the chat. Um, a couple of people were saying that Judge Nolan was actually their favorite character. Mm -hmm. And then someone else mentioned that they, that they weren't particularly interested in the title of the book, but as soon as they started reading, they just kept reading. Like the, when you were talking about, did the beginning grab you? They said, absolutely, the beginning grabbed me, even though I didn't like the title so much. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of discussion about that title too. So I'm, I'm always, and actually, I'm always glad to hear anybody's input, even if it's not like, oh, it's wonderful, Marvin, because you know, that's helpful to me. And uh, so, because I had, we had a lot of discussion. The Car Thief was the working title for the book. And we just put that on front. We said, well, we'll get a real name later. And by the time we got to the end of it, we just left it the car thief. It was like, oh, okay. By then we were kind of like, you know, cemented into it. But uh, it was originally not going to, to be the title of the book, but uh, turned out that way. What was the other question or what comment? Well, I was going to tell you. So I thought you did a nice job with Kelly. I was emotionally in church when he was in the library. I was mad at the police officer. Just let him go. Is yeah. what I was thinking in my head. And, and I work in this system. <laughs> I pissed off at the police officer for not just letting him be. I'm like, he's got this. I can't believe you're taking him in. <laughs> but he was a nice police officer. He was and like, I just wanted him to let him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he wanted that too. And I, there's one thing I did try to do. There's all, if you notice, there's this real balance. We have Judge Nolan, the really good judge. That's what I was going to talk about. And then we have the other judge who was not good at all. And we have a, you know, a not so good foster. And I didn't want anything horrendous. Like the not so good foster home wasn't abusive or horrible or anything. It was just, you know, not great. Uh, and then the Haverleys were great. I thought we <laughs> made, made them. And, I, and they, the, those type of people were some of my favorite foster parents when I worked in the system, the ones that had, had their kids and their grandkids and yes, really knew what they were doing. Uh, when he was in this, the OK foster home, of course, what I was thinking was, wow, that kid needs a casa. So if, if you were familiar with Casa when you were writing the book, and now that you've done all these, uh, you know, had all this interaction with Casa since the book, you know, maybe you have some. Um, I've been ordered to put a Casa in the next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is, in order for me to have the book go the way I want, I couldn't have a Casa person come saving. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a short book and not sold well. <laughs> and then it came a Casa worker and solved everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm, I got this book way early and couldn't put it down, so I kept reading it. And it helped me a lot going through the training for CASA because I felt like some of the things I'm reading about, then we're learning about the next week. And so I felt like it really worked well with the training. <laughs> well, good. And actually, I'd like to see that CASA. I just have to share this because it's like my uh, somebody just. <laughs> Sent my husband this text. I just have to share this because it just came yesterday. Jeff, your wife has been keeping me awake at night. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just cannot put that dang book down. I'm thankfully at the end and now looking forward to the movie. Uh, anyway, so then he went on this other stuff. So my husband wrote him back and said, well, thank you. I'll let her know. And I'm a little concerned about that first line. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. Back to your title. I liked the title because I it, it made me think from the very beginning when he, he wasn't a car thief. Right. And I thought, okay, they, he's going to get labeled and he can never get rid of it. And you didn't talk about his record being expunged until the very end. And the whole time through, I thought, okay, no matter what goes right for this kid, he's a felon. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be a felon and he's not going to be able to vote. And he's this and he's that. And he's this. So I, I like the title. And in Kentucky, which has one of the worst uh, voting expungement laws, I think we're the two worst in the nation. Any felony in your for the lifetime. So these kids that get tried at 14 for a crime are forever. Unless they get through that. But they, now there is, you know, you can petition, you can write instead of having it automatically. You can send all this stuff to the governor and, you know, do all this. And, and uh, but but you can you can expunge. But still, it's it's very difficult. Uh, to do. And then, you know, and it, all that stuff's on websites and uh, available for public to look at and all of that. So I, um, I don't work with juveniles. And so I was shocked to find out that juveniles, they put juveniles in solitary. Mm -hmm. That just absolutely tore me up. Um, yeah, in Kentucky, we're, we're, we're good about that comparatively. 
but I will say, and especially when COVID hit, it's been really bad. There, there are a lot of places that just when the kids come in, they put them in a cell for, you know, now they can at least do a rapid test, but they were putting them in there for two weeks, basically 23, 24 hours a day. And, and actually, if you, if you want to look at something, you can, you can Google solitary confinement in Tennessee, and you'll probably see my picture and come up. Uh, there was a Nashville uh, TV station, Ben Hall, uh, Channel 5, out of Nashville. They were doing a story, and this is just recently in uh, Tennessee. And when kids were getting committed, they were taking them off to this place called the Middle Tennessee Juvenile Detention Center, which was operated by a family court judge's wife and two other legislators as a private facility. And the kids would be immediately placed in a cell where they would stay 23 to 24 hours a day until they went to their final placement, correctional placement, which might have been days, weeks, or in some cases, months. And uh, so anyway, so they they were doing a story on it. And when I when I saw the story, you know, I, was, I, I put you know, Facebook, yeah, that little thing you can put on the end. I said, well, I'm in Kentucky and we would not we do not have that. No way. And so he contacted me and he wanted to come up and do our detention center, but he couldn't get permission to do it. So he asked if he could interview me. So I'm on that interview. Uh, and they, they interviewed also one of a, a kid that had that happen to him and, and his mother and talked about how scarred he was and how his mental health deteriorated. But it's not at all. I mean, there, it's improved a whole lot. Like I said, in Kentucky, we're good on that for the most part. I think. Uh, but, it, you know, in the nation, it's still a major issue. And I mentioned that in the back in the author's book. Uh, there, I think it was in South Carolina. There was a kid who. Um, uh, you know, a 17 year old hung himself in solitaire mm-hmm. and three days later, a 13 year old did. And you, and I thought, did that not make you all like check? You're supposed to have 15 minute so- checks. Mm-hmm. And like in our detention centers and so forth, they, there's a little there's a little silver dot on the cells and staff have to check. They touch that. They have a wand and they touch it so that there's proof that every 15 minutes they look in on the kid. Because before, before we had technology, they would just, they would put it in the log book and sometimes people would fake it. They'd go, you know, 4.15, sleeping, 4.30, sleeping. And the video showed they never left the desk or whatever. But now they have technology that show that they actually you know, do that. But yeah, it's not, a, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, it's got, it's not candy land. Uh, and I hear that from people, oh, those kids, they just, they got it so easy. It's just not, it, it doesn't benefit society in the long run. I mean, it makes it worse for society, right. for the community, because they're they're damaged. And I've got a couple of books I'm going to show you here in a minute. You might want to look that are kind of, you know, hit on that sort of. We have a question from Laura. Okay. Hi, yes. Um, I wanted to talk or comment, first of all, about um, how wonderful it was that um, Kelly finally came, was able to confess his um, fear or the thing that he had been uh, misunderstanding about um, the situation that caused his father to die and his uncle to die and how that, you know, sort of opened him up and allowed him to uh, make the attachment with Sam. Um All throughout the book, I was just very impressed with how well you used the fact that he was so self-aware and was able to, you know, communicate his feelings like that. But I kept thinking about some of my Casa kids and how, um, sadly, I, you know, their traumas don't allow them to uh, or at least you're not you're not really aware uh, in dealing with them that they have that uh, ability to um, process things that way. I was just wondering if you were ever um, inclined to maybe think about writing about children that don't express well, and how would you? Um, you know, ex- how would you go through the process of, you know, putting their thoughts in? Because I, I mean, that was just a beautiful way that you did that. It, it really demonstrates how important 
dealing with trauma is for making an attachment. But, you know, so sadly, we have children that don't get to that. You know, you know, you don't really know if they ever get to that point of resolution. Um, and I was just curious if you ever cons- would consider um, how you could explain those, how those children get to that point. Yeah, I see what you're, and of course, again, part of it was writing in order to, to for the book, you have to have a probably higher level of, of self-awareness. But I did also try to put in there that, you know, perhaps even with him, he's not completely that way. Like, like one of the things I liked, I don't know if you knew the analogy on there was about the box that sometimes it's too, you can't really deal with it. And, they, and that the counselor had said, you know, maybe you like put it on a box and when you're ready, you bring it down and you're, you process it. And if you don't, it might come get you and his king got him. So, uh, and he, he had suppressed a lot of that because he, he didn't remember it and he had, you know, blocked it out. And that, that is what's called a reversal. And I didn't know if anybody, when they were, and I would consider that for the next one, trying to, to do more on a, on a traumatic uh, type of thing. And the other, oh, one other point on Kelly though, the other thing I did point out on him, he's had a really good first decade or so. Yeah. And that's a huge difference with our kids. He he had an advantage for until he was 11. He had a loving, stable, good home. Uh, and for, you know, once you get those foundations built, you're, you're much easier to deal with trauma than a kid who's been going through it since they're four and five or six years old. So uh, that gave him an advantage. Some trauma because he lost his mom earlier. Yes, that's true, too. I thought about that um, when they told him his granddad died. It was so unceremonious how he how they told him your granddad, oh, your granddad's dead. Well, gee, that's the whole side of that family, you know, and he's already lost the other family. So I thought that was a lot for him to deal with. Yeah, wait, <laughs> le- at least he was uh, not locked up at the time. Wait, wait to have to tell a kid who's in juvenile detention, their parent died or their brother died. Yeah, can you imagine? yeah, and we've had to do that quite a bit, especially with gun violence. You know, your older brother, gang involved, just got shot to death, uh, can't go to the funeral. Uh, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> Makes that's why I retired for a while there too. It's like some of, some of that can gotta get to you. But were you surprised? I mean, that was one of the things I thought about. Is like you know everything looks fine. It's all wrapped up. Everything's good. He's, he's with Sam and Bonnie. The angels are singing. There's such a little bit left. <laughs> was anybody suspicious? Well, something's got to go on. It's like when you're reading a mystery, you know, and it looks like it's all solved, and then all of a sudden something happens at the end where the the guy who they thought did it really didn't do it. It was this wife <laughs> i like how you had sam deal with that though because, <laughs> like i feel like some people want to like just yank the kid back home and whatever ignore their feelings but i like how sam gave him some time to pull off they have had the sheriff just check on him and stuff and mm-hmm. gave him time to actually think about his choices if he wanted to come back or not I, I liked his time in Wyoming, and I have to make a confession. I've never set foot in Wyoming. <laughs> this is the glory of the Internet. You can Google anything. He was like, you know, I was Googling. I wanted him to put something on the grave, the the, the, the pine cone things or whatever. So I Googled evergreen trees in, in uh, Wyoming. Oh, okay, it's an aspen. <laughs> and I even Googled 10 things you wouldn't know about Wyoming. There's like there was that one where he said his father used to go out for the the tourons between tourists and morons. That was in 10 things about Wyoming. So I I was trying and actually if you notice when the, in the front of the new one, it has a, it's what they call praise pages, you know, where you get the endorsements. And and one of mine is from uh, the lady who, uh, Donna Sheen, she's the director of the Wyoming Children's Law Center. So I confessed to her uh, that I had not been to Wyoming, but she told me I pulled it off okay. <laughs> and it sounded like a small town in Wyoming. <laughs> what? I thought that Kelly's uh, trip back to Wyoming was almost like a metaphor for uh, you know, we see so many kids when they're getting ready to age out, all they have on their mind is going home, regardless of what that home situation was or it, what it is now. You know, they can't, they don't recommit because if they can just get home, it'll be okay. Or, you know, they can't, they can't plan, they can't even think. And so often, like I said, it's almost a metaphor. You know, they get there and they find it's not what they had been thinking all those years. And, you know, so I thought that was, you know, that really. Well, I just felt it'd be too fairy tale ending to leave it there. You know, they're okay. Now he's with Sam and all's fine because he really had never dealt with any of the other stuff. So that was one reason I had that where all of a sudden 
that that is more realistic that, you know, they're in a home and they're doing, haven't you seen that with foster care? They're doing great. You think, oh, it's all well and wonderful. Life's good. And then they're acting awful or the foster, you know, it come, falls apart. So did you think of that yourself? Did you ask her to German talk? Oh, no, I thought of that myself. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. She, she, she didn't really direct me with the story. She did some correcting. Like I have Sam and Bonnie at the theater on the back row because they have long legs and then they're being noisy and the woman behind them says, shh. <laughs> and she wrote in red ink. I thought they were on the back row, but I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Never mind. The woman in front of them did it. So it, it, there, were, there were actually several things like time glitches or something you would think. And I, I, I can't remember the one I caught towards the end. And I was like, oh, that would have been so embarrassing. And somebody said, hey, what? But have you ever caught that in books when you're reading it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I find things where I'm like, well, that's in the movies too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, movies too, where they, yeah. Do that. I think when I got to the reversal, it, well, first of all, I was yelling, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it so reminded me of the, the Casa kid that I worked with at that bond that they have with their parent, no matter what happened, they just have that bond and how it goes on for ever. He's now 24 years old and we're still dealing with it. Yeah. Um, because they just feel some responsibility. And so, that, I mean, it really kind of, it was an interesting way, I think, of kind of bringing that fact in, in a different way. But um, once I kind of figured out that's what was happening, I was like, you yeah, know, that, that would happen. Well, and, and that was another part that I like myself on the end was to say that even though we had this, you know, again, not too fairy tale, maybe, because at the end, even though he's saying, I love Sam and Bonnie and all that, but sometimes, I still yearn for what could have been that you right. still would think, you know, and I'm sure some of us have had that with losses, you know, a right. spouse or a right. but you know, and our parents <clears throat> that you had, you know, pass away earlier than they right. would have. And, and you, you know, for years you think, oh, they could, you know, my dad died at 62, which at the time my husband said, well, he's old. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, now well, we don't say that, uh, but, you know, and now, you know, I see some of the friends I occasionally run into and I'm thinking, you know, he could still be here 30 years later and still I could, you know, whatever. So I think, I think that's kind of a common grief right. sort of thing that people do. Right. My parents both died when I was very young and it, absolutely. I mean, you yeah. You know, right. I'm, you think they could have been I'm in my high school? Forty now, but yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see, yeah, yeah. I still have that that sense. And I, you know, I'm with my my casa kid with the womb bonded was when you know he was with a, a foster family, but it was his aunt and uncle. And I, you know, grew up in my aunt and uncle's house. Right. And um, you know, he just looked at me and he said, "I know they love me, but I don't belong here. This is not where I belong." I said that feeling will never go away. Yeah. He said, You don't know what that feeling is. And then when he found out I did, it's not quite cool. But um, it is very much what comes back. Now, I read an interesting thing that somebody had done in a book. And it was a kid who'd been adopted who kept saying he didn't know about who he was from and who, you know, anything about himself. And they, he did a genetic testing on him. And had something where it came up and said, oh, you you came from the Middle Eastern, whatever. Your people came over the mountains. And then your other side, those people did. And basically sort of gave him that sort of identity, even though it was like decades back or whatever. I, I had never thought about that. And that was kind of an interesting thing right. to realize you were from these tribes or this, you know, sort of thing. But that that sense of belonging is something that kids really need. Right. Since you brought that up and, and something else that I was reading and doing at the same time, um, I don't know that we deal with it a lot in Kentucky, but I know a lot of other states with ICWA. Does that ever mm -hmm. come up? With in, what? ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. Welfare Act. We've oh. Had we've had a couple of we do. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if we've been at this moment, but I know yeah. we've had at least three cases in the last five years. years. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's a whole other, I mean, that's a whole other belonging thing. Yeah. Let, me, let me go ahead and say, advance and then we'll do more. I think we've done a I want to be on it, but we can do one again, and we've got a basic uh, sheet on it. I can sorry. email you. <laughs> I already asked that one. <laughs> well, we, 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 we hit a few of these. <laughs> we, talk, we talked about the Easter eggs or whatever. So what did you think of the cover? 
Too dark. Too dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the old one. The new one's brighter. Oh, and if you notice, the new one added the subtitle too. Something funny when I first got the book, I mistakenly referred to it as cat thief instead of car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of that. You know, well, my, my brother worked at King Linden, so cat thief mm. was just. <laughs> so I, I realized, you know, why I was doing making that connection. But I kept wondering what made the grandfather so mean and so bad. And Me, because he needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> I just tried to make him a really rigid kind of person. And yeah. and, I, and there, the few other little hints in there were like, you know, when he first meets Kelly and, he, you know, and Kelly's like, I don't know anything about football. I don't, he's not a football player. He didn't, you know, he's kind of a, you know, he's talking about, you know, he didn't like to eat meat and, you know, he wasn't, mm -hmm. he didn't fit up to, you know, if he'd been a different kind of kid, my, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, like that he might have, maybe the grandfather might have bonded, but he was not the kind of kid he liked. I, I felt like that he was resentful and felt like somehow Kelly's dad had something to do with the fact that his daughter died. I, did I pick that up from the book? Well, actually, I, I, th there was a whole backstory, but in the interest, I have to tell you, I had to cut about 100 pages out of the book. Oh, wow. It was way too long. And some of that, that I did have so where... The oh. daughter, the well, he was he was he abusive. Made some comment about his your, daughter didn't your like him, and so she she left him. Did you know they they became uh, what just uh, right. yeah, yeah, just great. And and he went off and then was married out to this guy in Wyoming. And he, this is a this is a snotty uh, Philadelphia. And actually, one of the things I had in there, there's this group of people are called they're the first family Philadelphians. Uh -huh. and they're all supposed to be real snotty or something. And I had that in there. But again, I mean, I, we just got to the point. I mean, the book is long <laughs> for over 400 pages. So uh, we had, I had there were actually originally three chapters at the Haverly's and we took two out. and It was only down to one. Uh, and I kept wanting to, she kept saying, well, can you cut out the shelter? And I'm like, well, I really want him to go to a shelter. Can you cut out the second part? No, I don't know. You know, I just, I just really felt like those, but then a lot of periphery stuff. So I might can do some deleted scenes at some point. <laughs> I forgot those and put those out there. That might be, uh, that I might feel be. like it would make a good movie. Well, several people have told me that. I would love that. Yeah, I've already think of casting. And <laughs> Why would you have played the characters? Do what? Who would you have play your character? Yeah, that would be funny. I always thought of Tommy Lee Jones for Sam back in his younger yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> he's kind of now he's too old for the part, but back in his like fugitive days, I, I, I think he was kind of my model, tall and, you know, thinking for that. So I, he was kind of in my mind. Has anybody ever read? Here's a book for those of us who are older. Anybody ever read My Friend Flicka? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yes. the maladaptive daydreaming came out of that. Oh, Do you remember this? This was one of my favorite books from childhood. You can tell I'm old. See how old the book is? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you remember, he was really, he was a daydreamer. He would just get lost in his dreams. And it's like he flunked the test because an hour passed and he hadn't even written anything on paper because he'd gone off the la-la land. So that was one of my inspirations. And so I actually I actually Googled uh, daydreaming and children and that maladaptive daydreaming came up, which I'd never heard of before. And it was like, bingo, this would be perfect. So it's it's just kind of funny when you're writing Oh, and that's that's the other thing. There are two types of writers. There are plotters and pantsers. <laughs> plotters are people who map out their, their thing. They know chapter one. They know about midpoint. This will and they they actually diagram it. There's there's tools you can buy online to diagram and outline your book. And then and this I am like uh, Stephen King. Stephen King is a pantser. And you know what that is? It's right by the seat of your pants. <laughs> so Stephen King says, when I sit down, the characters take me where they want me to go. And that's how I was. I didn't, I didn't plan. I mean, I had some vague notions, but a lot of times I would start and I would be writing and I'd write six hours in a row and it would just take me somewhere different than I even planned to go and something, or I'd read something or talk to a kid and get inspired and think I want to, make, you know, work that into there. So then I have to ask you, do you know where the village is? Take her down. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you my car. <laughs> Definitely. I, I like to do a program at Chosen County. That made her so nice at Shaker County. It, it now Shaker Village. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, Shaker Village. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shaker Village. And, and it really was uh, the setting for when he goes to the village. Uh, and and I and like I said in the author note, I didn't say what state Kelly was in because I didn't want them to go like, oh, yes. Tennessee, we don't do it that way. And in Michigan, we don't do it. 
So I, I left it just generic so that anybody who was reading, but uh, I did I did make it the thing. So this is Kelly's room. <laughs> that's the East family dwelling. There They're you go. <laughs> no that, little room. That's his room. And these are the stairs that Sam had to carry him up and <laughs> up and down several times. And of course, I just love the beauty. And that's me <laughs> riding my horse through Shaker Town. Which one, of my, one of my staff can, is convinced that you've, you've made a character out of him. I did. Ben? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <It's Brent. laughs> yeah. And I had to apologize to I had to apologize to Laura because I just really felt it kind of needed to be a male character. Uh, she Laura, does that all the time. I know. Poor Laura. <laughs> Laura is the assistant preserve manager at um, Shaker Town. And she used to work at Flora Cliff. So I knew her from when she was there mm-hmm. before she went to Shaker Town. And so they have work days at, uh, I, I'm, I, I spent a lot of time in the woods killing things. So I'm, I'm out killing honeysuckle all the time. You chop it down and then you take a little thing around up. It's like in a little bingo dauber with the spongy end and you just daub it on the end. And so I spent hours doing this. So I would come to Shaker Town. They had the, like usually the third Saturday is a work day. And for a while we were going on Tuesdays. And so I told her, so I'm writing this book and part of it's going to be based at Shaker Town or Sh- Shaker Village. Uh, and I said, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to name it that. And she goes, oh, you know, you can. She goes, we, we have a whole bunch of books. She said, we have an archivist who's putting them all together. They have a million <laughs> books that are apparently based. They're, they're like Amish ones or uh, what do you, or, you know, the ones yeah. from the, the yeah. past. <laughs> Mysteries. <laughs> yeah, they have all these shows. Yeah. I said, no, I better not because you'll have people driving up wanting to go, where's the prison? Yeah, right. Uh, so <laughs> sure enough, I'm doing this. I'm doing this for this. Uh, group that's in Venice, Florida, and uh, two people were there were from Kentucky, apparently all retired, go to Venice, Florida, which is very, I think the average population there is 65. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so they, uh, they they brought up, they said, oh, I figured out it was Shaker Town, and I Googled to see where the minimum security prison was there. <laughs> well, and the other thing that made me with the, with the prison thing was I also volunteer all the time at the horse park. Uh, it, it, this is glory of when you get retired, you get to volunteer and spend your time everywhere. We there take volunteers here, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, they could go any places too. They could do flowers and everything. But uh, anyway, there was a nice gentleman there. I seen him on the tractor and driving trucks, and he was mucking stalls and doing. You know, I'd see him all around the park, and we're we're doing landscape stuff, and he would talk to us and. One day we're there and he said he was going to be, you know, leaving. He was going to Louisville. And I said, well, I'm sure they're really sorry to lose you and blah, blah, blah. And the people next to me are going, <laughs> he was an inmate. <laughs> <laughs> he had been transferred to a facility in Louisville. But I mean, truly, he was, I mean, he was just him. He was driving trucks and tractors and out. I mean, I had no clue he wasn't an employee. So, uh, so anyway, so some of that kind of based in, and and I googled like you know, uh, the, the, I got the handbook for minimum security inmates. We have Kelly read that and stuff. So I did try to make it as realistic as possible. I didn't want it to be uh, one of those books that people would go, that would never happen. So, <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, Shaker Shaker Town is one of my uh, favorite plays. <laughs> And this is one of my favorite lines, too. I, I, I really, and when we're talking about trauma, uh, I think that this one is, uh, is a really good scenario. Uh, and I had read at one time where people said it was like a box, like a ball bouncing in a box. And so I kind of took that and stole it and morphed it. By the way, they say good writers write and great writers steal. So I kind of stole that and uh, made it, you know, kind of like pressing up against a nerve or whatever. And that, that's how I think that it uh, that it does work. So I, I like that particular excerpt. And and we did talk about kids and, and detention. It's not a YA novel, but uh, I I do think kids, older kids who with decent reading skills would like it. And so uh, uh, a lady who is the assistant superintendent at a, a general detention center in um, Michigan gave me this story. And when she told it was right, we were, uh, I'm with the National Partnership for Juvenile Services on the training committee. And Right before our meeting started, she go, I want to tell you about your books. So I glowed the rest of the day thinking that kid had really that, you know, he had liked that, that he was becoming a, a reader after that. So and by the way, I want to thank you and Melinda, especially, too, for getting my book into libraries. So they deserves more of the credit than me. <laughs> And uh, and I do have a couple of flyers, fly, flyers uh, over there. If, if anybody, if I haven't hit one of your libraries, want to go ask? I found out that's how you get in libraries is people 
readers say, I want a book. Uh, and that's how they go. So I'm now in all, all the branches of Lexington. I'm in Woodford. Woodford, Bourbon, and Scott. Woodford, Bourbon, and Scott. Yeah, and Midway, right? Woodford, Midway, right? Woodford, and Midway, right? Jasmine Yeah, I'm in Woodford. Yeah, but no, there's the main branch down in your sales and the Midway branch. We got a Wilmer branch of the Jasmine County Public Library now. Well, if you yeah, yeah I'm recently. Not, if you can if you can give me in some of the others, I would love that. I'm in Boyle. I think it's Boyle. Or is it Hirsch, is it Boyle I'm sorry. Are you in the public schools? Uh, I'm not, but I just no, love to. Street Festival has a very active book club. I think it would be great for them, and their librarians are fantastic. Yeah, I would love I would love to do that. And and actually, without the COVID, I was planning on doing it at our juvenile detention center and doing a book club with the kids that are in the center. Uh, but COVID shut down and they, they uh, all visitors are barred. Yeah. COVID has not been kind to kids in juvenile justice. Well, and to child welfare, too. Uh, you know, it just it's really <coughs> interrupted. Topic. I'm sorry. I, I said, while we're on the book club topic, I would love to have in five at any given time, five different book clubs. And I would love to have you come to a book club. However, I can tell you of my book clubs where everybody always reads the book, at least half the people listen. And this isn't available that way. Oh. I think it would be an amazing audio book because you could have different, um, you know, different voices right. through the different character. Charlie's talking about Charlie wants to do it. He, he wants to, he, he's talked about that. He, he wants to be the narrator. Uh, and I think he'd be really good. I think if anybody ever seen, he'd be a great person to come to one of these. He, he's, he does, he's done several CASA things, but uh, Charlie Appelstein. Uh, yeah, he, he's done several for that. And, and while I'm on books, I just wanted to, to give to hit a couple of others here. Oh, I always had this problem. All right, she's on the thingy. <laughs> I was just going to recommend a couple of other books to you. Oh, can you get her next oh, slide? Yes. Okay. Is there another question? Okay. Okay. You want to ask a question first? Also, well, we have just a couple of comments. Someone said that they feel like this book shows the juvenile justice system in general seems to tell kids they are worthless. Or not worth the effort of rehab, and this book shows that there's hope for change in both the system and the kids. And another person said that the book offers information to help juvenile justice advocates bring about positive changes in our society, help save children from change in the system. Um, and then um, Carrie Corp had her hand raised. I'm not sure if she still wants to ask a question, but Carrie, if you do, go ahead and unmute. Thank you. I was wondering, Vicki, first of all, I just wanted to say I loved the book. I started crying on page 23. I do not read the ending ever. And 16 hours later, I was still crying when I finished the book. <laughs> it was phenomenal and so well edited and such an amazing balance of romance and humor and reality and it, I mean, it, it was phenomenal. I've been in CASA about a year, but I have been writing for a very long time. And um, I know writing very well. And I was blown away by your <laughs> debut, you. especially as an indie book. Um, very, very good job to you and to Mary and for all the things you cut out. I know how hard that is. But it was so tight, the pacing. I loved it. I've been recommending it to everyone, my author friends, my CASA friends, my school friends, my librarian friends. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just, my kids, I'm in Northern Kentucky, but my kids, six siblings are in Danville. So I'm driving to Danville once a month for my kids. Wow. And uh, it, I just, so many things in the book just really spoke to me. So my question is, are you doing any local appearances? Are you doing any book festivals or library appearances or anything like that, that we can tell people about and invite them to? Well, I submitted for the Kentucky uh, Book Festival, you know, the one that always usually at the horse park uh -huh. and now it's not. And I was not accepted. <laughs> so I, I was hoping to be. I was hoping to be at the Kentucky Book Festival, but it wasn't to be. I like to think that if they could have had the the big one that they still did at the Horse Park, maybe I would have made the cut. But uh, uh, I, I was hoping for that one. But COVID has kind of shut down a lot of that stuff. You know, a lot of the 
you know, uh, signings at bookstores and, and all the kind of things. And Cincinnati has that books on the Rhine or whatever that they do and uh, books on the bank or something. And they haven't been able to have that. Atlanta has a huge thing. Uh, so really a lot of the normal outlets with COVID. It's like I said, I wait, I released my first book. It came out April 2020, <laughs> right smack dab as the COVID hit. So, but in, in a way, the flip side of that is I have gotten around a lot more by doing the, the Zoom kicked in. So I have been able to do to do people. And, and I have to tell you that I really smile when I hear you cry all the time. And I always think I feel sort of mean about that. I'm like, oh, good. I made somebody cry a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel good about that. <laughs> but thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. And another author. And sometimes I think authors are your hardest audience because we get in our heads when we read and we we start to go, oh, would I have said it this way or that way? I was so invested. I was just like me and tissues and <laughs> like reading. But some of those festivals you mentioned, I've done a few of those. I have contacts. I'm going to reach out to you on Facebook. Oh, please do. What's your name? Carrie Corp. Oh, okay. C-O-R-P. Oh, okay. Yes, please do. I can use all the help I can get because I'm really, I mean, I'm not, this isn't about making money. It never has been. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm giving away books left and right and so forth. It really is. It's, it's a, you know, the, the mission, I guess is, you know, it's, that's the whole point of it. So uh, I just want books in hands. I remember years ago when I was negotiating a contract for the state for hotel stays for people coming to training that, the Holiday Inn guy. So I don't care about making money. I just want heads and beds. <laughs> and, uh, so that's how I am. I just want I just want books in hand. So anything that you can do to help me, I would I would love that. I'll reach out. Thank you. Um, she I have lots of comments. But, oh, for the for Sam Jordan Oh, okay. <laughs> that'd be good. Um, so uh, I'm new to class. I'm really excited to start a job. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, I'm a nurse. So the, I was interested in the making of a vegetarian and like what prompted you to do that. And also the fact that nobody kind of put two and two together. Maybe his um, loss of weight and not eating wasn't about quality of food or the lack of vegetarian options, but rather his sensitivity. Well, part of it was to make him uh, a more sensitive kid. It, you know, the whole thing about putting this kid in a military school, you know, who's, you know, the whole thing with the grandfather, it, it was a way for him to be a, a more sensitive. And, and also it's a little bit of me because I'm mostly a vegetarian. So and, and that story of the stockyard is my story. My grandfather took me to the stockyard when I was a little kid with my brother to watch cows being murdered as <laughs> they went up the ramp. And so pretty tripped and scarred me. Uh, so, you know, part of it was, you know, some little bits and pieces of, of me made, made that in there. But it was also to show that when kids go to adult jails, how it's not just mentally bad for them, it's physically that they, you know, they don't get like maybe milk. They don't, you know, they're growing. They don't get out in the sunlight to get vitamin D. Uh, that it's a lot of physical problems. And the other thing that happened with this was I really needed something to make Sam bond with Kelly because if he hadn't gotten sick, I don't know if it would have happened or not. I don't know. I guess my characters take me where they want. Would it, would it have happened? Would he have, you know, just put the kid over next door and he'd just been, you know, if he hadn't had that that six spell. So it all kind of, you know, I needed something. And, and Mary, I will say that that was the one thing she was hopeful with. Cause I helpful with, I had Sam come around way too soon on that. And Mary's like, no, 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 you need to drag it out, making conflicted. <laughs> it's like, so I did a lot more that oh, I'm trying to get rid of that kid. All right. You know, just trying to whatever. So uh, to, to, you know, have it where he finally, you know, ends up this kid worms his way into his, into his heart. <laughs> So, and like some of it, I really don't know. I didn't plan it out. Like I said, I just sat down and write, oh, he becomes a vegetarian. Oh, he goes to, you know, whatever. So some of it just kind of took off. <laughs> it really was weird. I mean, it's almost like I sat down to write a, a memoir. It was basically just to write about kids I knew. And it's not really even a memoir. Just I'd been out working at Floor Cliff, cutting honeysuckle. And we had two new volunteers from Colorado, a man and a woman. Uh, husband, wife, and he'd been uh, the principal of an alternative school. So he was telling some kids stories and I was telling some kids stories. And that night I thought, yeah, I should write some of these down because I'm forgetting them. And so I started writing them down and, and somehow at three in the morning, it morphed I'm writing a fiction book is very strange. <laughs> 
actually tell you, um, following up on the woman who was on the Zoom, I don't read fiction. It's not my choice. But this was offered, you know, and I thought, okay, you know, if, if Casa's going to offer it, okay. Maybe I'm getting a snack. I'll take a look. <laughs> <laughs> and I got drawn in right away. And I have never cried reading a book. <laughs> and all of a sudden, when Kelly had his breakthrough with Sam, I found myself crying. And I, I just, I, mean, I was shocked. I was, <laughs> oh my gosh, how did this book, how did this story grip <laughs> like this? And mm-hmm. touch me. So it, it was fiction, but there was an awful lot of good information that I learned from your book. So I actually cried one part when I was writing it. I only cried one part. I mean, I went, there was only one part where I actually was crying while I wrote it. And that was when he was at the cemetery. Yeah. Oh. And uh, my husband had been out with my son and came back in. I'm at the computer. He's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, your eyes are open. I said, all right. I was crying while I was writing. You're crying while you're writing? I said, yeah. I was like, <laughs> he, was getting, he was getting to me, you know, whatever, when he was at the cemetery with, with his parents and stuff. So, uh, Did Jeff read the book? Yes, and it's the first fiction book he's read since it's, college. Everything you said about him so much funnier. Knowing. Yeah, she knows him. So we work together at Government Center, and so you're very different. Oh, I know. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll, tell, I'll tell you how bad it is. He really, I, I don't know. I guess he read fiction in college because it was probably assigned, or he hadn't read a book, and I mean, he read historical novels and you know nonfiction stuff. And so he starts reading. And he goes, "Well, he's saying I." <laughs> Apparently, he never read a book first person. <laughs> and he's been one of the harsher critics because I would, uh, you know, all these people started writing him about it and how they couldn't put it down and how they cried. And he goes, he goes Well, nothing happens to it. <laughs> and then he said, We well, summed it up. I get a little sick. He goes, All the way. That was the big deal. He said, A few months in, he's like, What's taking so long? Oh, yeah. You finish that. <laughs> yeah. There, there's actually a movement, and uh, the, the person that was just talking to me, she probably knows about it. It's national. It's in November. It's national. Write a novel in a month. I may be saying it wrong. She probably knows. And the Carnegie Center even has a lock in where you can go spend the night to work on it. And so there's a book out called They Know Something. It's an abbreviation it's for it. Album of the That's it. Thank you. Say it again. Can you say it again? Oh, well, that's right. It's, it's she NaNoWriMo. There you go. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, there, there's a guy that started and wrote a book about it, and he, he does week one, family supportive, bringing me things. Oh, that's great. You're writing your book. And then, then he goes in, and by the time he gets to week three, week three, family says, aren't you done with that yet? <laughs> <laughs> and by the end, they're completely non-supportive of him. And he said, by that time, he's got beer cans lined up and <laughs> all of that. So... <laughs> I'm kind of curious what your process is like. Did you sit at a computer? Because I know you said at one point for six, you sat for six hours and just wrote because it was coming to you. Did you isolate yourself? Did you just kind of? Well, I had actually started off pen and paper. I was like up and I just, it started in the first several chapters were actually just pencil paper. Uh, and then, you know, that was pretty time consuming. So I finally ended up buying a new laptop uh, to actually work on it. And I would just take it everywhere. I'd take it places and I'd sit sometimes in the car and just do all. And some of my best, and, and again, the, I've read this as common too, my, my best writing took place before I wrote when I was usually bicycling, cutting honeysuckle or walking. And they actually say that it really, that there's theories that it really does jog that part of your brain uh, that where you're mindless or whatever, like where you get out of the shower or the first you get up in the morning. And, and if I got stuck, I'd go out and ride my bike. And then I'd like pull over and pull out my phone and start making notes. <laughs> Sam says this or <laughs> Kelly does that. And then I'd go home and write it up. So, you know, sometimes I had a little short blurbs and then other times I really got, you know, it's what, what you talk about where you really get into it yeah. and you just like sort of kind of lose track of who you are, where you are till your husband comes home and says, there's no dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I am a big reader, voracious reader. And I've read, it would be very hard to be an author if you were not a voracious reader. And I have always been a voracious reader. So I loved all the horror stories, the Black Stallion books and the My Friend Flickas and that, all the Harry Potters and the, the, the series with the witches and the um, um, vampire, the one that Discovery of Witches. Have you all read that one? Mm-hmm. Oh, I really like that one. 
Uh, and I was pointing out a couple of other books. This let me see. Let me see if I can fast forward here real quick. Oh, here we go. J just just for your information, just for a like type thing. This is a kids book. It's a YA book, but I think it's one of the best books about multi generational poverty. And it's it's fun to read. It's got he's got uh, he's got all these little pictures like you know his grandmother and uh, my favorite is the sister because they, uh, when they show his stuff, they'll say. Um, uh, Jeans stolen from Walmart, <laughs> shoplifted from. Uh, and he, here, oh, uh, th this is one of his ones there. Uh, you know, again, talking about for kids for truancy and sometimes going to school. Uh, and this is not. I'm sure you all have kids that you work with. That this, you know, it's not like June Cleaver where they get up and you go downstairs and there's orange juice and a nice healthy breakfast for you or whatever. So th this was his thing. These little cartoons he'll have in the hair about. Just how getting to school every day was such a, a complete, uh, you know, dad's hung over, nobody stops, but it's an excellent book. So it, like I said, it's a YA book, but I really, I really uh, rec I like this one too. How to pretend you're not poor. No lunch money and his stomach's rumbling. He goes, oh, I'm not hungry. <laughs> uh, field trip, school dance. I can't make it. I'm really sick. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's a reality for kids who live in poverty that, uh, you know, this is what they do. So, and I have to tell you, did anybody notice there's another car thief? Mm -hmm. Did you see that on Amazon? I highly recommend it. It's a really good book. And it's the reason my book was originally titled The Car Thief. It was one of my favorite books. And so I was like, well, this kid's going to steal a car too, but nothing else is in common with it. And that's one reason. But his is a, his is a, and that's the other thing too. You, you can't, I could not use a line out of, like when he's listening to Clint Black's, Black's, uh, Bad run of bad luck, and he mentions the name, but I couldn't put any lyrics. If you can't, they'll sue your ass off. <laughs> uh, you can't, you can't do any of that. But you can have uh, books with the same title. So I'm thinking of writing one called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so yeah, it, it was set back in the '60s, and it's a it's a really good book. And for any of you all working with uh, families and kids, I just have to throw it in there. This is a great book. Anybody work? They may have teenagers or grandkids that are teenagers. And I love the title. Get out of my life. But first, could you drive me and Cheryl to the mall? <laughs> so I just have to, I have to mention, and these are some nice juvenile justice books. Some of the things you were talking about back there on just the whole thing. This one's, this one's a classic. Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Jer Jerome Miller, Jerry Miller, went in and he was trying. It was a horrible uh, facility, big juvenile prison. And he kept trying to change the culture and the union fought him and they did, you know, he couldn't make any, any progress at all. So he got with his little buds in a back room for a few weeks and plotted out. And one day a whole bunch of buses drove up in front and they loaded all the kids and took them out and closed that sucker down oh. uh, one day in one, two hours. And they put some of the kids in foster care. They put some in college dorms, matched them up had like a paid a student to let them be their roommate, did all these really creative things with it. So he details how that, how the whole Massachusetts experiment closing reform school uh, came out. And this is a great book too, uh, that you can get these just really good about working, working with kids. And, um, and so I, I do have to, to, to let you know, I am working on a new book. Uh, and this is a, I think it's called, I need my author for it. I think it's called an epigram. It's a poem that you put in the front of the book. And I, I'm hoping I don't get the copyright issues. I didn't write this, but don't you love that? Uh, he drew a circle to shut me out. Heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Because the, my next kid in this book is going to have 64 previous placements. Oh, uh, and we know that this does happen. <laughs> I personally know it happens. And so you'll know Sam's in this book. So this, this is Sam talking. <laughs> so so Sam Sam is me. Sam's been called. He gets he gets this. Uh, and I was gonna I thought it was gonna be one and done. Mary's the one that said, "Why don't you have Sam do something with a new kid?" I'm like, "Well, I can do that." Um, so he gets he gets a you know it's a bookends the car thief Sam is with the therapeutic foster care agency. So he gets a referral on this kid that's leaving a juvenile and facility and has has nowhere to go. So he's interviewing him uh, to see about putting him in his program and and the, he's reading that the kid had uh, sixty four uh, previous placements. 
Uh, so this, this is one of the things I do with uh, when I'm training staff. Sometimes I'll now they work with kids. I always say sometimes it's good to do the surprise element. I call these I call these things automatic adult responses. You know, when a kid says nobody tells me what to do and then automatically it spills out of our mouths. Right. Well, I'm telling you what to do. Or maybe you'd like the judge to tell you what to do. Well, that's the kind of attitude they got you in. And the kids have heard all that. And what they hear is like, you know, Charlie Brown. blah blah. So Sam, see, Sam's smart. He goes, ah, independent thinker. I get that. <laughs> so I have the kids, you know, look, looking a, a little bit interested there. So I'm going to give you all, this is, if you don't leave tonight with anything else, I'm going to leave you with something that will help you in your line of work. Because at the end, Sam says you want to see a car trick. So, yeah. <laughs> Stop it wherever. All right. All right. Take it out. All right. Show it to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Got, it. Got it. This is a mind trick. Are you thinking about your cars? <laughs> the Ace of Diamonds? No, Let's try this again. <laughs> <laughs> Your finger reading one, stop it. All right, take the card, show it. <laughs> Don't worry, it's okay. You can now. I, I know what it is. Should have what? It's an ace of diamonds. <laughs> Do you know what? <laughs> They're all <laughs> well, I should have told you that I'm actually very magical. It's not a mind trick. Because what I can do, uh, I can make them all. <laughs> ah, yes. And if I want, I can change them back to regular cards. <laughs> All right, I have to tell you, the reason I'm telling you this is if you all want to make rapport with a kid, I've been using this for 50 years with kids, the roughest, toughest kids you can imagine, no kid can resist this. <laughs> None. I have had withdrawn kids. I have had kids call me an F and B, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever, and I'll pull, out the, I'll pull out the card trick. Do you want to see a trick? And nobody ever, I don't give them a chance to really say no. And as soon as I do it, they're always like, you know, how'd you do that? Or, you know what? And so my, my standard thing, I always tell them is a good magician never reveals how they do a trick. But since I'm not a good magician, I tell them. Plus, if I do this in juvenile detention centers, I'm really worried they'll kill me because <laughs> they, they really, they, they're not going to let me leave alive unless I tell them. So I just wanted to let you all know that you all should get this and do this. It's very easy to do. It's a Svengali deck. You can get it on. And actually, I brought a few. If somebody has 10 bucks and wants to buy one from me, I'll sell them to you today. But uh, Or even seven, but you probably have to make change. But otherwise, you can just go, <laughs> you can just go on uh, Amazon and get them. Kids love this trick. It's, and the, the trick of it is every other card is an ace of diamonds. So the deal is the ace of diamonds. Here we have an ace of diamonds on the nine of hearts. The ace of diamonds is shaped just a little smaller than the regular card. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, when I flip this way, you see the regular cards because you're seeing the longer cards. Mm -hmm. But when I put it down and tap, this is what magicians do they, to make you throw you off. And I pick them back up. You didn't notice? I'm not flipping really the way. same way. I'm flipping this way before I go this way. Oh, this way no. you see the shorter cards. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I, have, I, I was going to take this trick with me to my grave because I love being the only person that knew how to do it and to win over these kids. But, uh, but I was going to let you know if the kids, well, it's a very easy trick to do. And so you can just do it like that. So uh, I just wanted to share that because that's great. You got a card over there. Do what? You got a Spingali. Oh, yeah. Spingali. Um, he was a famous magician, S V E N G A L I. So, if you're doing anything with any kind of older hit, three year old, you wouldn't want to do it with, but older. Uh, so, again, I incorporate a lot of my real life into my, into my things. So, I have Sam, I didn't share that with you, but I have three or four, two or three pages or Sam doing the trick with the kid that I just did with you. 
And so that that's the thing I do with this whole thing that, you know, how for a few seconds he becomes just a kid. Um, so, you know, have him go. He goes, I'll let you on the secret eventually. I'll even teach you how to do it. And now the kid's barred. Well, how's that going to happen? He goes, uh, he slides over a promotional chocolate bar with uh, Phoenix Foster Care Agency about looking at us for placement 65. <laughs> so this kid is coming to foster care, but he's not going to be with Sam and Bonnie. Uh, Sam is placing with, with uh, a, fo- a single foster father. So if that looks like an interesting, you could wait for the book to come out. The first chapter is actually on my website, uh, which is, I guess, you know, we, get, we got time up, you go there. Um, that's my email and uh, uh, where's my, my website? Oh, yeah, the read author. And if you go to the menu, what's happening, then the, the first chapter is there. And I have to say it's coming a little slow. Uh, it's all up here. It, well, I'll tell you what, I have written the first eight chapters and the last six. Oh, cool. And I did that with Kurt. So sort of thing. I, I, I already know how it's going to end. And I know the beginning. It's that darn middle, <laughs> the muddled middle that has to be worked out. So it's all up here. I'm just having a hard time. But it, when you spend a lot of time marketing your book, you don't have as much time for, for writing as you would. And the other thing I would ask is if you all could post reviews for me, uh, that would be great. Amazon and if anybody does good reads uh, is another one or put it out on Facebook, then I, I would appreciate it. And that's my spiel. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I know you've been here a while. Will Kelly be in the new book? No. Kelly's off doing Kelly things. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'd be the, the uh, single father, uh, father, father. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he's mentioned once or twice just by Sam. So I have a son, blah, blah, blah. But he, he's not in And Sam is a more minor character. He, he's, he's in it, but he's a more minor character. And it's really going to focus on uh, the, the foster father that he puts in with. Uh, who's somebody he basically coerces. And I, all right, I have to tell you a little, just one little bit more about this story <laughs> because um, Bo Necco, you know, Necco Foster Care uh, Agency, whatever. He, he had a deal when, when I was working with DJJ, we started using them putting kids in foster care. And we had a lot of kids who ran away and did a lot of AWOL. So he had a trick he did with them. When they come in for, came in for the first day, he told them if they would stay a week, he would give them a hundred dollars. And, uh, so, you know, they'd be like, yeah, I'll, you know, and he did. And he took them out and he bought them clothes. It was really their clothing allowance. <laughs> but he had them convinced that, you know, he's like, well, I can't just give you the cash, but I'll take you shopping. You can spend it how you want. And of course, they would have got it anyway, because it was their clothing allowance. But he convinced them that. So so some of that with this, this sleight of hand is my card trick kind of thing. It's, part of it's going to be is that this, this kid and the foster father are going to kind of you know, it's going to be kind of a thing where they sort of a little bit like Sam and Kelly, where they end up, you know, coming together and it, it'll have a good ending. Sorry. <laughs> read the last book. Yeah, you won't have to read. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much telling you that my stories are going to end basically, basically pretty good because, like I said, I've been a lot of my life. I can't control the ending. I, I, this one I can control. By golly, I'm making it good. Brain's going to publish. That book also. I haven't talked to Charlie about it yet, so but he probably he probably might. Although Charlie actually had made it his goal in life to get me a bigger publisher. He said he'd like me to get one of the big ones. So he said he's happy to the two year contract. We bow out of it immediately if anybody really good came along. But you know that that's that's it's a difficult. You know you don't you don't. Um, indie like she was mentioned. Indie publishers don't get picked up too. I mean, there's a few famous ones. Uh, who is it? Still Alice or whatever? The one about dementia? Uh, is that Still Alice? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's one of the more famous ones. She she wrote it and, and pitched it, and uh, all the all the she got rejected by them all. They said it was too depressing, and nobody wanted to read about Alzheimer's. And uh, so she self published it and made millions. <laughs> and then they picked up her second book. They gave her a two million dollar advance right mm-hmm. out the front. So there's a few famous stories like that, but they're. They're pretty unusual, but I've been happy it's done as well as it is because I really thought, you know, when you read about self-publishing, uh, one of the things I read said, plan to sell to 12 of your closest friends and yeah. family. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I thought, well, if I sell 100 books, I'd be pretty pleased with that. And so I'm going on 3,000. So I'm, you know, pretty, pretty happy with that and still just kind of getting going. So I- I've been pleased with how it's gone so far. I want to let you know, um, when I signed up for CASA and became a volunteer in May, I had told my VM, I just want to deal with kids from like five to 12 years old. I said, I don't want to go any further. 
my first case, the next day after I graduated, was a 13 year old boy. <laughs> 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 and, uh, his build and stuff was the same as my, my boy. Oh, wow. And uh, so it was like a Fake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now I actually have a 15 year old girl also. So yeah. I guess I'm just in treating this really. I was like, you know, I think I'm going to watch. I, and, and I, love, she's I love teenagers. Open. We'll take all ages. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I guess that's the comedy shows. Teenagers have always been my favorite group. I said I always want them old enough to cuss me out. <laughs> uh, when I was a juvenile court probation officer, that's how we decided who got who kids, because we had one person in our office who was very soft spoken and kind and, and you know, patient with the kids. So when we had those quieter kids come in that you kind of had to wrestle something out about it, you know, whatever we go, oh, that's Angela's, <laughs> you know, whatever. And when they come in, what the hell is in is that bitch over there? Like, okay, that's Vicky's. <laughs> <laughs> I came in here to and try to bring life into a corpse. So, <laughs> nasty kids are like, not they'd say those nasty things, they'd say, you know, F you, whatever. I said, You hardly know me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, anyways, I like, I like, I do, I like the truth. I like, I like to say something unexpected and have them blink and think that's not the usual response well, that, no. that I get. <laughs> Uh, was it bad? <laughs> I'll tell it. Liz that. went to a residential treatment facility uh-huh. and there were teenage boys and one of them was she went by and says, well, that's some milk. And she says, yeah, I do drink milk and walks on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, my, and then, then her cousin child says, Miss Liz, that's not what that means. <laughs> and he says, I went home and told my son, he said, oh, mom. <laughs> So it's a running joke around the office. I'm about a lot of jokes around the office. <laughs> she just, res- or no, she said, it's not the first time I've heard that. Hey, that'll go in your memoir book. <laughs> no, there are some famous, there is a famous uh, Casa book. Is that the one somebody else's kids or? There, there's some there's a famous book that's on there. I think if you look under Amazon under child advocacy or something, it comes up. But there is a cost of person that wrote it. I thought it was because I'm like really white. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you said, she says not the first time I've been walking. <laughs> One of my favorite stories when we first had to start using therapeutic foster care with delinquent kids was we had some, you know, like a really tough inner city kid and he was placed with a a foster home that was in a very rural eastern Kentucky. And uh, he was in the house and the other kids started going, you know, hey, James is throwing gang signs. James is throwing gang signs. And the foster mother looked over and said, well, you're going to do that. Go outside. Don't get your clothes dirty. <laughs> so she was like, you know, he was like trying to shock her, you know, I'm tough, you know, and all that. And I think, go outside. No, you're going to a typical mom response. Uh, I don't know what would be, but they are funny. There are a lot of funny stories. They can break your heart. There's a lot of sad stories, but uh, I've seen a lot of good things. And, and the nice thing is, too, and I tell this to juvenile justice staff, is a lot of times you don't always get to see the results of your work right away, but you, you plan to see them. And I will tell you, I had kids on my case, though, that I thought, sure, were destined to end up at Eddieville. And they were like, you know, and I ran into them 20, 30 years later. Hey, Miss Jones, remember me? You know, yeah. <laughs> Some I don't. But, you know, and he's got, a company, he's got his landscape company out there. He's got two kids, not cut company, but truck. You know, he's working. Pay. You know, he's doing doing fine. So you, you don't always know. I say you don't know who to write off. That was my other J.K. Rowling story. When, when she was making the movies. She didn't have the last books done. So the people making the movie didn't know how it would end. And they wanted to, to save some money. So they had a couple of characters they wanted to write out. Uh, and one of them was Jenny Weasley. And the other was the lead bottom kid. <laughs> and she's on the set. And she was like, I wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> so you, you don't you can't always write off. You don't you don't know how it's going to turn out. And sometimes it takes years. But uh, I do appreciate and I, I have my other little thing in here. I've got for, for you all, I guess ah, it's not there. Uh, that you all are my heroes. I, I can't find the slide, but there we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, actually, I love causes. I love what you all do. And thank you so much for, for giving your time to the kids and knowing that you make a difference. I have a good friend that has a couple of foster kids now, and she loves their 
want to maybe one of you all, but I'm not going to say uh, just whatever. But she she really has been very complimentary of her CASA person and what they've done for her. So uh, not only just the kids, but with the foster parents, I think makes a big difference knowing somebody out there supporting. So I will wrap it up and turn it over to you all if you want to. Well, thank you.